Okay, we have to talk. We need to talk about how to graph some of these things. Uh, we've been talking about these sine curves. Uh, I'm just going to use a I, I always um, go back to the sine curves and use that for most of my examples. Uh, but you can do the same thing with cosine. It doesn't matter which one. Uh, so I, I will try, as we do examples, try to bounce back and forth. But when I write some general rules, I usually just write sine. Uh, but you can have the same rules for cosine. Uh, and, and really, if we're picking cosecant, cosine is a tangent, you have the same, same idea. So where I've got sine written up there, it could be any of the fixed trig ratio. Or trig function. Um, when looking at these, uh, just some key things that you guys are, are already aware of based off of college algebra. Uh, this number out front, we're going to call it the amplitude. Okay, the amplitude, which um, is actually found by taking, uh, if we look at a graph, it's taking the average of the max value minus the minimum value, and, and that will give you your uh, amplitude, okay, uh, absolute value, because it's got to, we want it to be uh, a positive number, Um there could be, there, there, you know, generally we want the, when we talk about the amplitude, we talk about it as a positive number because it's a distance. Uh, but it could be in the formula or the equation written as negative. Uh, and just the, the plus or minus out here, uh, just like any other thing in college algebra, if there's a minus sign, a negative will reflect across the x-axis, right? Okay, if I take y equals x squared and then write y equals negative x squared and compare them, their reflection across the x-axis. It's the same thing as if I take, um, you know, just start with sine of x being that graph. Uh, if, if I rewrite that so that it's a times sine of x, and it asks me to make a, a slider here for a, you see that a is going to, as I adjust that, it's going to change the height, right? Okay. Right now you see, um, if we were to go from, let me see if I can put some points on here. Let's just put the maximums on here, the maximums and minimums. If I do that, okay, um, the distance, the vertical distance between you know, B, which would be my max or my minimal point, and C, which would be my maximum point. If I take those Y values, so it's the Y value of uh, B and the Y value of C. If I subtract those, and then let's take the absolute value of their difference, okay? Um, you see that that number is 6, okay? And if I take that and multiply it by then 0.5, you see that I get 3, right? So taking the max minus the minimum divided by 2, and absolute value unit gives you the same as that number right there, which was then our amplitude. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. Um, so that amplitude is just the distance from the x-axis right now to a maximum or it's the x-axis to a minimum, but it's a distance, so it's got to be positive, so we took the absolute value. Um, but you're seeing how it, it's kind of analogous, or it, it's, I say now, it's exactly the same as a vertical stretch for your other functions that you've dealt with, right? Okay, is it stretching? Your y values are normally, right here, your y value would be 1 for C, right? Okay, well, when that becomes, when A becomes 2, or 2.01, you see that your y value there is 2.01. So the y value got stretched by a multiple of 2.01. Um, if it's negative, okay, so I'm just going to put sine of x here. If I just multiply by a negative out front, you see how it reflected across the x-axis? Okay, this point C went down here. This point B goes up there. Uh, and we get that curve. Is that, is that okay there, everybody? 
Um, and then you can see, obviously, if I make it negative, uh, we can do that as well. Um, but then, still stretching. Now we would say, you know, this, this negative tells me the reflection with the 3.25, but 3.25 is still the amplitude, okay, as a positive number. Um, so just keep those things in mind as we, as we see those. Um, this number here, this D value, okay, uh, if I had like x squared plus 4 or square root of x minus 10, what does that number on the end do to those parent functions? That moves it up and down, right? So what do you think it's going to do to this parent function? Move it up and down, okay? So this is an up and down translation. Okay, obviously, if it's positive, it's up. Negative, it's down. Uh, then that uh, that middle part with the B, and I'm, is, is everybody okay if I erase this amplitude stuff? So we can write underneath this B stuff. All right. We want this number right there to be a 1. Okay. If it's not a 1, we have to do some work to get it to be a 1. All right. Uh, and uh, essentially what would happen if it was not a 1, uh, using these kind of arbitrary values, is that you'd have something that looks like A sine of BX plus then uh, BC. Well, is there a common factor of B that I can take out of both those? So I divide that out, and it will get me into that blue statement, and it will have an X having a coefficient of 1. If X has a coefficient of 1, that plus C, and it could be minus, tells me my left or right translations. Okay? If it's not... A coefficient of one, we have an issue in telling what our left and right translations are. Okay, uh, and, and I'll I'll show you what I mean by that. Going back to a simpler curve, um, going back to maybe a, a parabola or something like that, to see the difference. Uh, this B value is very critical. Okay, uh, that B value is going to be the main uh, component of our period for these functions, okay? Uh, if it's just sine, and just sine of x, the period is 2 pi. But if we start adjusting it and start changing the coefficient of x, essentially, it changes the period, okay? So the period is always equal to 2 pi divided by whatever that b was, okay? And that is actually probably the first the first thing that you want to look at when you do these problems, especially in the event of trying to graph them, the number one thing we want to look at is the period first. And that's going to tell me how to set up my x-axis. Okay. Um, all right, so let's let's talk about that that b value here. If I were to give you, um, you know, like y equals you know, x minus 4 quantity squared, you guys know that that is a movement of the parabola to the right four units, right? Okay. But if I were to give you something like this, and I don't know how much we talked about this in, in college algebra. If I were to give you 2x minus 4, that quantity squared, it's not a direct four units to the right because I'm not subtracting four from x anymore. Does that make sense? And, and I, I don't think we talked a whole lot about this at all, really, because this is going to incorporate a, a horizontal compression, and, and we didn't deal a whole lot with those because of how they can look like vertical stretches. Um, but just to give you that graph real quick, okay, if I gave you, let's just put the parent function y equals x squared in, Okay. And now I'm going to type in y equals, uh, we'll go 2x minus 4 quantity squared, and it gives me that thing. Okay. Uh, and let me, let me, 
me see here. I don't. I just don't like the way that it transformed it. Is that the vet? If I double click, sleep that way. Um, you see that we thought maybe it moved to the right forward because that minus four, right? But what did the graph really do? Move to the right too, because we can do some algebra here with y equals. We had two x minus four squared. If I rewrite that, we could we could factor out a two out of both these, right? So it looked like this. Does that make sense to everybody? And now because we are able to see that we're subtracting now a two from x, a two from one x, that's where that movement to the right of two comes from. Does that make sense? Okay. Now what your or what GeoGebra is doing here to, to rewrite that that way is that they're saying, okay, well, this is just a, like an A to the first times B to the first squared. And we write, rewrite that as A squared B squared, right? So they're saying that A to the first is your two. So two to the first would become two squared, right? And now your B is this thing here, raised to the first power. So it's going to give you X minus two squared. So then we've got four times x minus 2 squared, and now we can maybe see it as what GeoGebra is transforming to. But that is showing, and I hope that you recognize it, showing that you have any movement to the right of 2 here. The idea is when you are tra translating these things left and right, the only way that you can tell the accurate movement is when you are closest for x1. You've got to do some preliminary work to do that. Okay? Now, with the sine and cosine, it's going to be pretty routine it's going to be the same process over and over and over again um, to do this okay um, now I've got two versions of this written down here uh, this one here uh, is just lacking a set of parentheses sometimes you'll see this one written by hand a lot this way uh, this one is the one we kind of have to use with technology okay we have to have that extra extra set of parentheses there for, for the technology to know what we're doing, okay? Uh, but I want, I want to graph one of these. So let's say uh, let me just clean this up. Let's go let's say that we got y equals well, let's go three sine. I'm going to write it as, just keep it kind of straightforward, kind of easy right now. Let's go 2x plus, I don't know, pi over 2. All right, we'll leave, we'll leave the the D value is zero, so it's not going to be moving up and down on us at all. All right, so the first thing we want to do, guys, is deal with our uh, graph or the, our function here and get it back into a better format. We want that 2x to be a 1x. Does that make sense to everybody? So I'm going to rewrite everything. Except for now I'm going to factor that 2 out. So when I factor that 2 out, factoring is just a fancy word for what? Division, right? So I'm going to take 2x and divide it by 2, and that gives you x, right? Now I'm going to take pi over 2 and divide it by 2, 2. Now, what happens here, guys, if you divide that pi over 2, I would say 90% of the time it's going to be a fraction. And dividing fractions by... Whatever you want to divide by, whether it be a whole number, an integer, or a fraction, is a pain in the butt. Dividing fractions by fractions is not something we like to do. Okay? But the way we do that is to multiply by reciprocals, right? If I have pi over 2 and I want to divide it by 2, what would I multiply it by? By half, right? So multiplying by half is exactly the same thing as division by 2. So that's something that you want to think about, and, and it makes this.
process a little bit easier. I simply take pi over 2 and multiply it by a half. It gives me pi over 4. Okay? Now, just before you go on and start graphing and trying to do stuff, make sure that when you distribute that back in, undo what you just did, and see if you still get this thing here, right? Does that make sense, everybody? Um, I think that's imperative that we do that uh, just so that we, we know if this stage is correct. Uh, so if I ever make a mistake, I can at least come back here and uh, kind of start over from this point. Okay. Uh, just kind of identifying things here. This 3, again, that's my amplitude. Okay, but it's it's our vertical stretch. Okay, and when I say vertical stretch, I'm talking about in reference or correspondence back to the parent function. Okay, parent function had a bunch of y values of 1 and 0, right? So now this one's going to have a bunch of y values that are multiples of 1 and 0 and multiply by 3. So you have a bunch of uh, y values that are 3 and a bunch of y values that are 0. Is that okay? Uh, I think this one's a little bit easier to do than the other one right now. So that one there, what's that pi or 4 going to tell me? Yeah, this is going to go left pi or 4 units. Okay, so every parent function point moves pi or 4 units to the left. That two, okay. Dictates our period. Your period is 2 pi over b, and b is that 2. So we'll take 2 pi over 2. So my period is pi. Okay? Now, what does that tell me? My period is pi. Remember what we were talking about yesterday? The period is the x distance when it takes a curve to start repeating itself, right? Okay? Um, and, and for us, when we start kind of with a uh, an empty graph with no labeling on the x-axis, uh, that's going to be kind of the first thing we look at because that's going to help us start labeling our axes. Um, and the way I do it, I'm not saying my way is right. Um, it works, but I'm not saying it's the only way to do it. Um, I start with de deciding where do I want pi to show up, okay? And then I start cutting that in half and then quarters and then eighths and stuff like that um, to get the rest of the graph, okay? As you guys are doing these, not only is it important that we are able to find that information, but when you start graphing them, just trying to make a little bit of room here, you always want to have the parent function in mind or have it in front of you actually drawn out already. Uh, so I'm just going to draw it over here. I'm going to draw this, this, the parent function is sine of x, right? So I'm going to use some similarities with the parent function to help me create this function. Okay? So we know the sine function starts at 0, goes to 2 pi. Okay, both those have y values of 0. Halfway in between, we get pi, and there's another uh, x-intercept. Halfway in between there we get pi over 2. And here we get 3 pi over 2. And those are heights of 1 and negative 1 respectively. Okay. So that then would be one cycle, one period of our parent function, right? Okay, so what this curve is doing, what this 3 sine of 2 times the quality x plus pi over 4 is doing, based off the period, is instead of that thing making one complete revolution between 0 and 2 pi, it's now going to be all squeezed down so that happens between 0 and pi. Does that make sense? And the way I kind of envision or visualize uh, the sine and cosine waves and how they compress and stuff like that is, is I view them as like springs. Okay? Um, and if I put my hands on both sides of that curve and start pushing inward, okay, everything on a spring 
kind of moves in relation or proportion to one another, right? So when I start compressing this from 0 to 2 pi down to 0 to pi, the symmetry that's laid out in the pair function should still exist in the transformed function, okay? And what I mean by that symmetry is did you have a point here? You know, obviously this is my beginning and that's my ending, right? Okay, those red lines start and finish. Was that point halfway in between? Does that make sense? Okay, so over here when I start graphing this I'm just going to dictate where pi is. Maybe pi shows up right here. Okay? Zero is right there. What would be halfway in between zero and pi? Pi over two. So maybe that's pi over two right there. Okay. All right, so my symmetry idea, guys. If there is... If this thing is going to... Uh, exist inside one period, we know that the sine function, the parent function, started at a y value of 0, and after one period, it finished at a y value of 0, right? So over here, it's got to start at a y value of 0, and after one period, it better finish at a y value of 0. Does that make sense? Okay. So at this point, I'm going to er erase these lines here in a moment, but that point right there corresponds to that one. And that point there corresponds to that one. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. Now, halfway in between over here, we cross the x-axis, right? So right here, halfway in between my new period, we better cross the x-axis as well. So that point relates to that one or corresponds to that one. Doable. Okay. So we set those three points up over on the parent function. Would you guys agree that that green interval right there would match or correspond to that green interval right there? Okay. Halfway in between the green interval over here on the parent function, you reach your maximum, correct? Okay, so over here, halfway in between, which would be located at pi over 4, we're going to reach our maximum. So I'm just going to set a maximum up here. I'm not going to label it yet, but I'm going to reach my maximum there. Is that doable? Would you agree that that blue interval corresponds to that blue interval. And halfway in between over here, you reach your minimum. So halfway in between over here, we're going to reach our minimum as well. So halfway in between. Okay, now you can, once you, I, I guess, maybe you know what that point is, but that once you find this point right here, this top, this top point, that distance is your kind of your counting tool to go through the rest of the graph. That's pi over 4, plus pi over 4, plus pi over 4, plus pi over 4, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So if I do that correctly, this would be 3 pi over 4. And we reach a minimum there. Okay. So again... That top point matches or corresponds to that top point. This top bottom point matches to that one. Is that all right with everybody? Okay. So now we could we could draw a smooth curve in, in between those. Don't do that yet, uh, because right now these points, these points only satisfy y equals. Now, I, I haven't talked about the amplitude. What should my largest y value be for this curve? should be 3. So that number right there should be 3. And that should be negative 3, right? Okay. So right now, all I've got is the points 
for 3 sine of essentially just 2x. Okay. I have not moved them left or right yet, correct? Okay. Which way are they going to move? They're going to move left. Okay. Um, so, sometimes you'll have to adjust your uh, axes here. Uh, because maybe the way you've got them written, maybe uh, they'd be in like sixes or something down here, or intervals of sixes, but you have to move by a twelfth or something like that, okay? That's not the case here because these are written in intervals of fourths, right? And don't we have to move by a fourth? Okay, so it's kind of nice in, in that respect, but I do need to maybe show where negative pi or four is over here. Uh, so now, each point gets moved over to the left power of four units. And that process of moving them to the left is pretty easy if your axes are written in regard to or in terms of that horizontal movement. Last year we kind of did this one where we had to move in terms of pi over 12. Okay, well, if my intervals are written in terms of pi over 4, I gotta read, I gotta move things in pi over 12, um, at a pi over 12 distance in between. But I would want to rewrite these so that they're 12, so that I can find out how far one pi over 12 unit is so I can move them all the same. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, but now that you've got these, And if we look at this, so if that's if that's one period, we should be able to replicate that over and over again, either to the right of it or to the left of it, just by using kind of your symmetry ideas, um, knowing that that if this thing starts at negative pi over four, okay, it's going to finish at three pi over four. So if I want one more cycle, so that that period right there, that distance. Oh, that distance was pi, right? So 3 pi over 4 plus another pi, that would be what, 7 pi over 4? Okay. So then halfway in between, and then halfway between there, and halfway between there, when you get to start getting those points that kind of correspond to these points here, and we start plotting our x and y values accordingly and get another period. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, what happens with these things, guys, is that it, it takes a lot of uh, understanding of your parent function, but then everything else is kind of trying to understand symmetry and how you can, you know, cut the shapes up into intervals and use that aspect to help you realize where you order pairs go for your, your transforms and that. Um, we're going to spend a couple, you know, today would have been nice if we had the whole 60 minutes, but... Uh, tomorrow we'll probably spend at least one more full day on this and, and maybe uh, have you grasp a couple more of these. Um, there are, if you struggle with this, there are a lot of resources on the website uh, of people going through and showing you how to grasp these using kind of a similar um, approaches. Another approach, guys, is, and it's kind of a pain in the butt, but it, it's to essentially start with your, your, uh, parent function, and then erase all the values on the x-axis and the y-axis, and then just rename them um, based off of what your transformation is. That's, that's really hard, but it is an option. I hope they have a great day. I'm going to. Thank you. You too, Zach. I like it, Vincent. Thank you.